Traveling to the Sun with Ulysses, this week on Planetary Radio. Hi everyone, welcome to Public Radio's travel show that takes you to the final frontier. I'm Matt Kaplan of the Planetary Society. For 18 years, it has circled the sun following a lonely path. Now the Ulysses spacecraft is nearing its end. We'll look back with Nigel Angold, Mission Operations Manager for the European Space Agency. Emily Lakdawalla will answer another of your questions in this week's installment of Q&A, and she'll get the job done in barely more than 100 Martian seconds, while Bruce Betts will help you pick a new name for a Saturn, a Saturn car, that is, belonging to a listener. That will be right after we take a look at the current night sky. Bill Nye, the science and planetary guy, is on vacation this week. We come to you as the American Democratic and Republican parties are finally making their choices of presidential candidates official. But how do John McCain and Barack Obama feel about space exploration and development? Fortunately, both have just issued space policy position papers. You can read them at planetary.org. And I hope you know that planetary.org is the place to find what I firmly believe is the best collection point for all news planetary. Emily's Space Blog has put up links to some of Don Dixon's newest space art. You may remember that ace artist Dixon was a guest on this show a while back. Emily also provides her critique of Twitter in space, or should I say, Twitter in space. Turns out the Phoenix Lander isn't the only probe using the ultra-brief online tool to provide mission updates. Ulysses was one of the first space exploration missions to depend on an international partnership. The solar power orbiter was only supposed to last five years. Now, at 18, failing power is likely to spell the end of the spacecraft that showed us the north and south poles of the sun for the first time. Nigel Angold has been working on the Ulysses mission for every one of those 18 years. Though he works for the European Space Agency, his office all of that time has been at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab near Pasadena, California. That's where I found him a few days ago. Nigel, first of all, thank you for joining us on Planetary Radio, and congratulations as a representative of the Ulysses mission, which is uh, going on 18 years of uh, observing the solar environment. Yes, thank you very much. Officially, uh, we were supposed to end the mission July 1st this year um, because we were expecting the hydrazine fuel on board the spacecraft to freeze. However, we've managed to keep it from freezing up until now, and... uh, we are continuing to take scientific data on a daily basis. So we are still going, although we are not sure how much longer we can can, uh, continue. So the rumors of your death were greatly exaggerated, obviously. Absolutely. And yet I was getting those releases. Apparently you guys were as surprised as anyone? Well, yes, I suppose we were surprised, but um, one of the problems we have on the spacecraft is that we don't actually have very good temperature monitoring of certain areas of the spacecraft. And where we are expecting the fuel to freeze uh, is one of those areas where we don't have good monitoring. So Mm. although we can model the thermal environment on board the spacecraft, we don't have absolute measurements where we really need them the most. So difference of a few months um, is quite usual for a particular event to occur. And in actual fact, we haven't ever had any good hard data for freezing hydrazine because for 18 years we've been trying to avoid freezing it (laughs) and we've managed to do that successfully. Uh What is the outlook? I guess it's hard to say without that additional data. Well, the outlook isn't particularly rosy because in order to keep the hydrazine from freezing, we are actually flowing fuel through the pipes. Every two hours we we move, shift fuel um, through a cold spot uh, just a few centimeters at a time, but uh, that uses up about a half a kilogram of fuel every month. So within a few months, we will, if we don't freeze, we will actually run out of fuel anyway. So mm-hmm. not very many more months to go. You've been with us from the beginning. In, in fact, you've been here at JPL as a representative of, of ESA. Did you have even the slightest inkling, I bet you've been asked this a million times, that you'd still be here 18 years later with a spacecraft that's alive and kicking? Uh, absolutely not. I mean, the mission was designed to last for five years, basically, we managed to do that very successfully. And then bit by bit, we've been extending the mission um, a few years at a time. And now it's 18 years, and it seems remarkable that we've come this far. As we have found at Mars, as Cassini is finding in the Saturnian system, there are huge advantages in terms of science 
if you can keep a spacecraft out there for a long time. That certainly seems true with Ulysses. That's absolutely true for Ulysses. The, the beauty of uh, a mission like Ulysses is it's, it's making unique measurements because it's flying over the poles of the sun. It's the only spacecraft to do that, and uh, there are no um, plans for another one to do it. Hmm. So it's taking a unique perspective of the sun. Because we have extended for 18 years, we've managed to go through one 11-year solar cycle uh, and seen a, a, a reversal of the magnetic fields of the sun, uh, which, which reverses every 11 years, so that's a 22-year cycle. So we've, we've got about three-quarters of, of that so-called Hale cycle recorded. Why do we go over the poles of the sun? And uh, an analogy is that if you were limited to exploration of the Earth uh, around its equator, you would hmm. never be able to see what was over the poles. You would you think everything was covered in, in rainforest or whatever, but you wouldn't ever predict uh, the polar ice caps. It's the old blind man and the elephant uh, story. I don't know if that's a big story where you grew up, but here, uh, if you just feel, feel one piece of the elephant, you don't know what's going on at the exactly. other end. Exactly. So the idea was, that, I mean, because every, every other measurement was made in the essentially in the ecliptic plane where all the, the planets are and where where all the other s satellites uh, are located, going over the poles of the sun would give us a different perspective. So we have three orbits of that, uh, so we are measuring at each latitude three times as opposed to once, and, and each time at a slightly different um, condition of the sun. A and in fact, you were able to get through solar minimum and take it all the way to solar maximum. I guess that was even lent its name, the Solar Maximum Mission, to the continuation of the Ulysses uh, mission? That's right, yes. Um, prior to Ulysses, measurement of the solar wind was, as I said, based upon uh, observations in ecliptic. And typically you would see a solar wind of around 400 kilom kilometers per second, which is actually the slow solar wind. When you <laughs> get up to higher latitudes, it's around 750 kilometers uh, per second. And these are... Uh, originate from the coronal holes. The high solar winds were thought to be unusual, and as it turns out, it's the slow solar wind which is the unusual. For the most part of the solar cycle, it's the high solar wind which is around for most of the time. It, we're not here really to talk science because you're more on the engineering side, but I do want to at least mention about the magnetic field. Ulysses also made some tremendous revelations about how that magnetic field is structured and its relationship to the solar wind. Yes, essentially, I mean, there are the two um, observations made. Firstly, I mean, the uh, field reversal is, is kind of like just a, a dipole rotating, yeah. a, a bar magnet, if you like, rotating. So at one point, the, the North Pole is, is, is facing upwards, and then it flips so as it's facing downwards. So it acted act very much like a dipole. But in, in other respects, the magnetic field of the sun is more com complex than was uh, originally uh, thought so this will lead to new models of sun's magnetic field and and hence uh, the whole of uh, the dynamics of the heliosphere mm. back to the longevity of this spacecraft space is a nasty nasty place how do you design a machine like this over design it in fact i think you called it uh, ulysses an engineering overachiever still to be able to put up with those kinds of conditions for that long seems quite an achievement. It's true. One of the things in our favor, I think, was the fact that in order to get out of the ecliptic plane and, and to get into this unique orbit over the poles of the sun, we had to have a large amount of energy to change its orbit. We launched on board the shuttle, which got us into low Earth orbit, and then we had two very large booster motors. But even then, that's not enough to get us out of the ecliptic plane. So uh, these booster mo motors took us out to Jupiter, and then we flew past Jupiter uh, and used its gravitational field to sling us out of the ecliptic plane. So it kind of tilted our orbit by almost 90 degrees mm. by flying past this huge planet. But because we flew past the, a very big planet such as Jupiter, which has a very harsh radiation environment, mm -hmm. the spacecraft had to be designed to cope with that. So you have to have radiation-hardened components and that has uh, meant that uh, it's 